Abraham! If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes true concerning which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods, whom you have not known, and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to find out if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall follow the Lord your God and fear him, and you shall keep his commandments, listen to his voice, serve him, and cling to him. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death, because he has counseled rebellion against the Lord your God who brought you from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery, to seduce you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk, so you shall purge the evil from among you. My name is Shmuel Eliezer ben Moshe Nadler. I grew up uh, in New York City, so you'll pardon me, I'm still learning English. Uh, but growing up there, I had a lot of questions. How could we believe in a good God who allowed such a horror of the Holocaust to happen to our people? Uh, the rabbi, uh, a very dear and sweet and gentle man, he said, Shmuel, the only thing I can tell you is what I tell myself, he who believes uh, cannot question, and who questions really cannot believe. Well, that, that didn't help me at all. And so I went from appearing uh, very religious growing up to then uh, becoming uh, quite rebellious in a sense. Hitman two, three, this is Hitman I was a two, map maker uh, for the U.S. Army in Vietnam. During the Battle of Tet, uh, we were under such attack. Horrors were going on, either you were on drugs or you were drunk. My commander of my unit, he thought he was like John Wayne, and he had scotch in his, in his canteen, and he was drinking scotch. He passed out just before the battle began. Uh, some of the sergeants got so overwrought, they were breaking down crying in the bunkers. You know, they say there's no atheists in the foxholes. And so even though I was pretty sure there was no God whatsoever, the whole thing was like, idiocy, you know, the opiate of the people. But because of the kind of horrors that go on in warfare all the time, I might have been interested to hear some good news even in Vietnam there. And the chaplain comes by and all he said was, I'm getting out of here, but good luck to you. Some of you won't be here in the morning. I, I thought this is a religious person. You know, They were bringing troops through uh, and going on to other areas of the deployment. Uh, and so they were sleeping out in the open, and we were under attack uh, all the time, incoming missiles. And I remember saying you know, to the officer in charge, I said, listen, let them sleep in the barn, uh, because at least they'll have some protection. Uh, and the officer said, no, they don't have the clearance to sleep in the barn with the maps. The next morning, all there was was a puddle of blood, puddles of blood from these fellas, and all I could think of was the heartache. War is a horrific thing. Perfect thing. I was what might be considered uh, politely in English an unregistered pharmacist, a drug dealer, not particularly kosher. I would run into people who had the nerve to be on the streets of San Francisco proclaiming this Messiah, Jesus. I was a little bit off put by it because they smiled too much. I didn't think that people should smile that much. Who could be that happy? But one of them, one night, had the nerve to try to tell me that I needed to believe in Jesus. I felt so offended. Let me tell you why. Uh, I thought, oh my goodness, they want me to go to the side of our enemy. It turns out that he, was, he said he was Jewish. My heart broke for him. I thought, a Jew who believes this? 
This has to be the dumbest Jew who ever lived. What kind of Jew believes in such narishkeit, such foolishness? He invited me to go to what he called a Bible study. I thought maybe it was like an archaeological find. They have a Bible, they'll look at it from different sides. I couldn't figure out what that might be. I would go there to laugh at them. I thought it would be my evening entertainment. Now, I got there, and there was a pretty ordinary-looking group of people. Each one had a Bible. I thought that was pretty interesting. They each had their own Bible. But they were taking everything so seriously. What do they think? These are God's love letters to them? <laughs> uh, and the portion that they were looking at was in the prophets, in Isaiah chapter 53. In traditional Judaism, where we don't study Isaiah 53. That portion is skipped over uh, by... Uh, our rabbis. They wanted me to give my opinion of who I thought the prophet was talking about. Give me a minute. To, let me take a look at this thing. As I was reading through it, it would talk about the uh, one. It said, all, all, all we, like sheep, have all gone astray. Each one has turned to his own way. But Hashem has laid on him the iniquity of us all. It said there that he would be killed, cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people. What a strange thing for our scriptures to say. And I got to the last verse in that section. And even though he'd been cut off, it said there that he would give uh, the gifts, the spoils uh, to the stronger faith because he had been cut off for my people for my sins. How could he, I thought he had died, now he's giving, I said, and it came to me that he hadn't, that maybe he came back to life. At that point, it came very clear what this section of scripture was speaking about. It seemed to be talking about you know who, that Jesus. Nothing is supposed to be this clear. These are really tricky, sneaky people. They put part of their Bible in what's supposed to be my Bible. What a bunch of idiots thinking they're going to be able to trick real Jews, you know? And so when they said, so who, finally, who do you think it's speaking about? I looked at them and I said, I don't know. I don't think anyone can tell. The Bible is such a mystery. No one can fi ever figure this out. They look so disappointed. And they said to me, well, we'll be praying for you. I said, fat chance. What kind of God is there that'll want to answer prayers for someone like me? Where was this God in the Holocaust, I said to them. Over that period of time, I found myself thinking more and more about it. My goodness, this is, this might be our Messiah. I didn't like that. I remember, you know, okay, God, if, if you have a Messiah for us, that's fine. But please, someone besides this Jesus. I was living in a, in a very bad place where people were doing drugs but some thoughts entered my mind. It seemed somehow clear to my thinking that drugs were opening me up to the spirit, but it was the wrong spirit, that there was a spiritual battle for my soul, but I was on the losing side. I wasn't sure until I got on my knees there and I cried out for Jesus to save me. I woke up that next morning, somehow, I knew my life was different. I wasn't sure about all the details, but some things, and in my heart, I actually believed that, that Jesus is Lord, is our Messiah. I wasn't sure what to do. I wasn't sure where to go. Who do you talk to about these things? Not in that world. Well, there was a restaurant. There were pictures of, of Jesus on the wall. I really didn't know what would make someone a believer or something, so I thought that was a pretty good shot. So I went in there, it was really early in the morning. All right, I didn't know what to do. I went, they were just opening up the place, you know, the manager opening up. And I said to him, hey, listen, Jesus saved me last night. What do I do now? The guy looked at me and said, I don't know, you want breakfast? <laughs> then I remembered that a long time before, I had gone to this, couldn't remember what they called it, a Bible thing, but they, maybe they would know what to do. I couldn't believe that they would remember me. But nonetheless, I called them up and I said, listen, my name is Sam Nadler. I came to your Bible thing a, a long time ago. And, but listen, Jesus saved me last night. What do I do now? 
they were so happy. They had been praying for me every day. Today, when people ask me, how can you believe in God in light of the Holocaust? In all of our afflictions, he was afflicted. And so to be his people means to be kind of uh, his raw nerve endings. In all of these matters, he is afflicted. Uh, he mourns and he cries over all of our pains and issues, let alone something like the Holocaust. But he, may his name be blessed forever. Our Messiah, he loved the unlovable. He forgave the unforgivable. But yet he died a horrible, evil, torturous death by crucifixion. He understands the pain of the Holocaust. He knows what it's like to go through your personal Holocaust. This is what he brings to our hearts as well. The objection would say this. If you want to know what Isaiah 53 is talking about, just read Isaiah 52 and Isaiah 54. The context is the return of the Jewish people from Babylonian exile 550 years before Jesus. Actually, there's some truth to that. There is some truth to that. That is the context. But here is the flip side to it. <clears throat> Here's the flip side to it. When the Jewish people went into exile, in the days of Jeremiah, in the days of Ezekiel, Daniel is, is one of the exiles. When this takes place, it's a time of horrific suffering and upheaval for the nation. It's unprecedented. They have not been delivered this time. The temple was not spared this time. God did not intervene miraculously as he did say in the days of Hezekiah. They went down and their temple, Yahweh's temple was destroyed and the chosen people have gone into exile. An absolute trauma for the nation. Now, now. In the context of the Babylonian exile, the prophets also prophesied what was going to happen. Jeremiah said, you're going to go into exile, and then you're going to return after 70 years, and you're going to rebuild the temple, and it's going to be glorious. And in fact, the whole nation is going to turn to God, and God will make a new covenant, and he'll write his laws on their heart, and they'll never stray again. And not only so, the Messiah will be among them, and there'll be a perfect reign of peace and righteousness, and and, and, and the nations will turn to worship the God of Israel. Did it happen? Partly. Partly. Partly happened at that time. Jewish people did return. Temple was rebuilt. A lot of things were restored. But was there a national repentance as expected? No. Was there the immediate coming of Messiah as expected? No. Was there the turning of the nations as expected? No. So, so you got the down payment, the rest to come. But you see the whole prophecy is on the heels of, against the backdrop of, coming out of Babylonian exile. When we come out of Babylonian exile, there will be a glorious restoration. When we come out of Babylonian exile, there will be a glorious deliverance. When we come out of Babylonian exile, Messiah will come. That was the expectation. And then it was in that season of return from Babylonian exile, rebuilding the temple, reconstituting the nation, before the second temple was destroyed, that the Messiah did come. And then he begins his work, which continues to unfold until the end of this age. So, so yes, the context is coming out of Babylonian exile. That's how many of the Messianic prophecies came. Out of this destruction, redemption's coming and it's right around the corner. Well, that's how it seemed. It looked right around the corner. Have you ever driven around a bend? Remember that, that principle of Messianic prophecy? The Messiah is expected on the immediate horizon of history. Going around a turn, you don't realize that turn is three miles long. You think it's just 30 feet long. You keep driving, 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 driving. That's how it is. But it is right around the bend. It is right around the bend. Now, here's what's important. Here's what's important to look at. Not only the historical context, which underscores and supports everything I believe as a Messianic Jew, but also the Eved. Who is the Eved? So we are told, this is the servant, Eved is servant. This is the servant of the Lord coming out of Babylonian exile. The servant of the Lord comes out of Babylonian exile. This is the nation of Israel, and that's what the prophecy is about. Ah, here, here's, here's what's interesting. When you look at 
the references to the servant of the Lord in the book of Isaiah, beginning in chapter 40, 40 through 51. We will see that it can refer to the nation as a whole or to the righteous remnant within the nation or to the one righteous one, the Messiah, the ultimate servant of the Lord, the one who fulfills the destiny of Israel. So let me just give you some examples. Uh, for example, when, when we see verses like Isaiah 41, 8 and 9, but you, O Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I've chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend, I took you from the ends of the earth, from its farthest corners I called you. I said, you are my servant. I've chosen you and not rejected you. Well, this is plural. Children of Abraham, servants of the Lord, it's Israel as a, as a nation. Isaiah 43, 10, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant. So that's plural. It's the nation as a whole. But at other times, Israel, the servant, is not responsive to God's program. Isaiah 42, 18 through 20, Hear you, deaf, look you blind, and see who is blind but my servant, and deaf like the messenger I send. Who is blind like the one committed to me, blind like the servant of the Lord. So sometimes the servant is blind and deaf and unresponsive, and then other times, Isaiah 42, 1, Here is my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him who will bring justice to the nations. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand and I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. So you've got the servant of the Lord a few verses later speaking of the nation and the nation's blind and, and deaf. And here you've got the servant of the Lord who's obedient and righteous and who brings sight to the blind. In other words, liberty to the captives who are, who are in prison. What's the point? Targum, Rabbi David Kimchi, the third of the great medieval Jewish commentaries, Rashi, Ben Ezra, Radak, David Kimchi. David Kimchi and, and the Targum say that this servant in Isaiah 42.1 is King Messiah. So they recognize the servant here is referring to one individual. When you get to Isaiah 49, some of the rabbinic understanding is that it's speaking of the prophet as an individual servant of the Lord. And there it's fascinating. Isaiah chapter 49, the servant is called Israel, and yet the servant has a mission to regather Israel back to God. How can that be? Well, just like Jacob, Israel was one man, and yet Israel could refer to the nation. So this servant of the Lord epitomizes Israel and is called Israel, and yet has a mission to Israel. And look at this, according to Isaiah 49, 1 through 7, he appears to have failed in his mission. And God says, don't be discouraged because not only have I chosen you to regather Israel, but also to be a light to the nations. Who's that sound like? Apparently failed in his mission to Israel, yet becomes a light to the nations. And we will know then the final fulfillment, restoring Israel to God. Who, who does that sound like to you? And then when you get into the 50th chapter, very, very specific word about the, 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 the servant of the Lord suffering terribly. It's speaking of an individual. So here's what you have. You have sometimes in Isaiah, uh, beginning in chapter 41, that the evid of the Lord, the servant of the Lord, can be speaking of the nation as a whole, called to be Yahweh's witnesses, but, but often dense and, and unresponsive. Then, then, you have this righteous one, this individual who fulfills the mission and destiny of Israel, himself is called Israel and yet is called to the nation. And he is the righteous one, one individual. By the time you get to the end of the 49th chapter and to the 50th chapter, the servant is just an individual. By the time you get to 52.13 through 53.12, just an individual. Some have looked at it as kind of like a pyramid, starting with the base of the nation and going up to the point that one individual, the Messiah. So when we look at the text in context, what we will see is that the servant of the Lord, go through every reference, sometimes can refer to the nation or perhaps a righteous remnant within the nation, but ultimately the righteous remnant of one, the Messiah, the Redeemer. He's the one who suffers and dies for our sins according to Isaiah chapter 53. 53.
father. Forgive them. For they know not what they do. Into your hands, I command my spirit. Oh. 